Hello, and welcome to the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery Call for Science for our 2022 annual meeting uh, webinar. We wanted to have an opportunity to get together with you today to discuss the upcoming Call for Science, to discuss some of our plans for the 2022 annual meeting in Oto Experience in Philadelphia, and to share with you some best practices and tips as you begin to put together your submissions for the Call for Science. I'm Danny Chelius. I am the annual meeting uh, program coordinator for the American Academy of Otolaryngology. I am a pediatric otolaryngologist at Baylor College of Medicine, and I practice pediatric head and neck surgery at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. We've got an all-star uh, group of uh, submitters with us today uh, and contributors, uh, and I'd like to introduce you uh, uh, one at a time. So first, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Marlene Wong. Uh, Dr. Wong, please tell everyone about yourself. Hello, great to be with you today. I'm a professor in the Department of Head and Neck Surgery at the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine, and I practice rhinology and skull base and head and neck surgery at both uh, UCLA and at the VA hospital. I've been on the annual program committee for about three years now. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong. Uh, Dr. Michelle Carr. Hi. I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist at the University of Buffalo, and I have submitted a lot of abstracts and had a lot rejected, so I've learned the hard way, things to do, and I've been on the program committee for the last year. Thank you so much, Dr. Carr. And finally, Dr. Christina Dorisman. Dr. Dorisman is a trainee that I got to know at this annual meeting. Thanks for being with us. Christina, tell us about yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm an intern at Vandy um, this year. I went to UNC for medical school. Um, I've been lucky enough to uh, attend the academy meeting three times um, so far, uh, twice in person and then once virtually last year. So I'm excited to share my experience. Thank you very, very much. Um, you know what? I, I took this picture after Dr. Doris Mann's scientific session of the four trainee presenters uh, who presented that day in Los Angeles. And uh, Dr. Dorisman, can you tell our listeners a little bit about your experience at the Academy? What have been some of the highlights uh, in attending for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a couple. It's hard to like choose just one. So I'll start one with um, the fact that the meeting was in LA. It's always really fun to get to travel and go somewhere else for a meeting. So not only do you get to attend the meeting, but you get to explore the places um, like the city that it's in as well. And so that was definitely one of my favorite things. Um, the second would be that um, having gone through the application process last year, which was all virtual, this is the first meeting I got to attend since all that. And so through that, I got to meet some of my co-applicants that I didn't get to meet in person um, during the application cycle. I got to meet them in person at the meeting. I got to meet residents that I met on the trails, faculty that I met on the trail. And so that was a really um, fun experience now that I'm finally in the ENT, getting to just like meet them in person. Um, yeah, finally. And then um, the last thing... I mean, there's a lot of things I really enjoyed about the meeting, but one of the highlights for me, I guess, was also the women in otolaryngology meeting. Um, that's really fun to get to gather with other women in the field and talk about our experiences and hear from a keynote speaker about her experience in medicine um, and just like connect with other women. I just think that was a really um, fun experience and I look forward to going again in future years. I look forward to you going again in future years as well, because I loved hearing your science. It's, it's unique to have an intern getting to attend at the annual meeting. I, that is awesome. Can you tell everyone, how did you get to, to go to the annual meeting as a resident? Yeah, absolutely. So during um, medical school, I did a research year um, and from, I, I, I completed a project during that time and I presented it at the Academy last year. And then during my last year of medical school, I kind of built off that project and um, thought it was a good project that could be submitted to the Academy. So I submitted it um, last year and it got accepted um, for an oral presentation this year. And so I was kind of lucky enough to go. Um, and I'm hoping that I can continue to do that intern years have been a little bit tough, so it's hard to get projects going, but um, I'm hoping that, you know, in future years, I can do that um, as well. And actually, the first time I got to go um, was, I didn't have it a project. It was just through a leadership grant um, for medical students. And so that's another great way that others can attend. And I know they have some for residents as well um, to help fund them going to the, to, um, the, the meeting. So that's another great way for other people to attend if they can. 
I think I think the more you can get to the academy meeting, uh, the earlier in your career, the better because of all the mentorship opportunities, uh, opportunities to to help you with your own career discernment, uh, educational opportunities. I mean, for me, when I was a trainee, going to the academy meeting was like going to ENT Disneyland uh, or, or ENT Disney World because there's just so many opportunities for trainees at the meeting. But we know that for a lot of uh, trainees, the ticket to attend, in a sense, is being able to present your science at the meeting. Do you have any advice for uh, trainees who want to get to attend the meeting? Yeah, like I said, um, I kind of you said it, like getting projects, submitting projects, whether that be a poster, an oral presentation um, is the best way to do that because your program, most programs are pretty willing to let residents go to the meeting if they are presenting something. But I, I've also seen other residents um, who are on committee meetings um, or committees um, whether that be for the academy, like for, you know, the board of governors or say SRF, the um, section of resident fellows, uh, being on those committees and present being on those boards allows residents to go to meetings as well. And so if you're not able to present um, running for a position and those can allow you to go to those meetings as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Doris Mann. Dr. Wong, you've been to a few of these meetings now yourself. Can I ask you to share a couple of your favorite memories from the academy meeting? Well, I've been to probably 30 more meetings than Christina. <laughs> I've been a long time members ever since I was a resident. I don't learn any leaves. And they're always so much fun. I mean, the early days, it was kind of scary uh, being there with all the experts that you've heard about. You've read their books and their papers. And then when you get to know them, you realize they're they're wonderful, ordinary people who love to mentor. And I think at every level um, we will find people to mentor us and we will find people to mentor us. So that's what I've enjoyed about the academy. I've gotten to meet people from all over the world. I've been active institutions and work on projects and presentations. But I must say one of my favorite memories actually was from this last meeting in Los Angeles, which is my hometown, obviously. But the reception on Saturday night at LA Live was just amazing. It was just so wonderful to see people in person for the first time in almost two years and just to visit and eat and joke and talk. And, and so I would say that ranks right up there with among my favorite memories of the Academy meeting. Yeah, I have to say. Um, what is it going to look like, Danny? So obviously the last couple of years have been a little different from the all virtual to the hybrid. Do we have a sense of what the uh, 2022 meeting will be like next year? I think it's something we're actively discussing and uh, we're discussing it in the committee. We're discussing it with our staff. Our plan is to return to a, a live in-person meeting, much like the meetings of years prior to the start of the pandemic, thinking back towards, for example, the meeting in New Orleans in 2019, where everyone is actually in Philadelphia um, presenting and learning in Philadelphia. And uh, that's the plan at this point. But we, we know that this pandemic can throw us a curveball, uh, much like the Delta variant did last summer, where we may have to pivot to having some kind of a hybrid meeting. Um, right now, there's actually a, a wonderful group of academy leaders meeting as the future of uh, meetings task force, uh, as well as some outside consultants to sort of get their finger on the pulse of the future of medical meetings. And uh, hopefully we'll get some guidance from, from that process as to how we move forward into the future, both in the short term during the pandemic and in the long term uh, to make it the most effective meeting and the most effective opportunity for our members. But I think next fall, our plan would be to have a meeting primarily delivered in Philadelphia to uh, attendees in Philadelphia. There will still be some sort of uh, on-demand viewership available after the meeting uh, and potentially during the meeting. And I think the health and uh, wellness uh, of our community is really going to define what the ultimate meeting looks like next fall. So I would say to our submitters, uh, be prepared to come to Philly, uh, which is an amazing town with an amazing uh, history and heritage in otolaryngology, um, but also be prepared to be flexible in case we see things happening with the pandemic like they did this past summer. Um, to that end, this is the, the actual Call for Science website. And uh, for those of you viewing the, the webcast here, uh, this is actually a QR code that will take you directly to uh, this launch page for the Call for Science. 
Um, when you go into the call for science this year, you'll log in uh, on this page. And when you click the login button, uh, it'll take you to uh, a sign in. A couple of things on this launch page that I want to point out. Number one, the submission guidelines. If you click on the submission guidelines, there is a very hefty document that talks about the ins and outs of the submissions um, that gives great advice on writing an excellent submission. And I would strongly recommend read the submission guidelines before you go to create your, your uh, submission. I would actually encourage you to go read the submission guidelines now as you think about your submission, as opposed to doing what I typically did, which was read the guidelines as I was submitting on the last day of the call for science. Because there's actually great advice in there for putting your, your submission together. The second thing, you can click on this link to the gap analysis. Our um, education committees under the leadership of Dr. Jeff Simons, the education coordinator, have put together a list of educational gaps in the previous meetings that we would love to see addressed at this meeting. Um, my little brother famously once told me when he was a junior in college, you know, Danny, if, if you go to class, they give you the answers to the test. And I said, well, yeah, they, they do. That's, that's what class is for. Well, the gap analysis is giving you the answers to the call for science. It's telling you the topics that the committee is most interested in getting new submissions on. So if you're not sure what you want to submit on, go look at the gap analysis and hopefully it'll, it'll create some ideas. So when you log in, you'll come to this splash page. This is actually the same login that you would use for the Academy's uh, website. It's entnet.org. And so if you are not currently an Academy member, you'll have the opportunity here to create a non-member account. In fact, you'll have to create a non-member account to then log into the call for science. The benefit of us all logging in through the Academy's homepage to the call for science is that all of our data we know is correct in the Academy's databases. We've entered it there. And so it'll import your data over to our vendor website who's running the call for science and make sure that we have correct email addresses, phone numbers, et cetera. So you can create a non-member account if you're not already an Academy member to then start your submission. When you start a submission on the Call for Science um, submission portal, um, this is the opening page. Uh, you'll start with your proposal title, and then you'll have to pick a submission type. The submission types for this next year have not changed from the past year. They're the ones that you're used to seeing if you've ever submitted before. We'll talk about these in a little more detail in just a moment. Um, you'll also have the opportunity to indicate if this is a repeat submission or if this is a new submission. Um, and I think that's really important to let the committee know that you have some history presenting this topic if it's one you've, you've previously given before. Once you've put in your title and picked your submission type, you'll go to this, this task list and all seven tasks have to be completed before your submission is complete and available for the review of the committee. Um, there are a couple of things I'd like to highlight here. Number one, uh, the first task is to create your presenters. When you add a presenter, I can't stress this enough, you have to have the correct email address for your presenters. We know that there are some Academy members who will give set, uh, five or six talks at the annual meeting, usually a limit of five hours of content. And a lot of times they're not the ones submitting the presentation. They're being submitted as presenters by other submitters. It is very important for you to check with all of your co-panelists, co-authors, co-presenters to see which email address they'd like you to use so that they don't have three or four different email addresses floating around in the call for science system. So please check with your co-panelists about what email address they would like to have used in the call for science. Um, I would ideally like to recommend you use a non-institutional email address or that you make sure that it will accept email from the academy that it doesn't get filtered out to spam. We had a lot of trouble with communication last year and a lot of presenters would go in and find it in their spam boxes or spam folders. Uh, or that it was blocked by institutional firewalls. So you might want to consider using a non-institutional email address for your submissions in the call for science. The next thing, um, when you are selecting your presentation duration, in the past, we've had two-hour courses, one-hour courses, 30-minute courses. Please note that for this year, all submissions will be for a one-hour presentation. If you have traditionally given a two-hour presentation or would like to give a two-hour presentation, you must submit two separate proposals as part one and part two, and you can actually indicate here in question 12 that it's a two-part proposal. The next thing is that we have to have disclosures for every presenter. We've allowed the submitter to actually go in and do the disclosures 
for all of the presenters on their panel this year, but then you are responsible for all of the information you put into the disclosure. And if we have incorrect disclosures, we will have to withdraw the submission. So please check with all your panelists to make sure you've got their disclosures right. Or if you get your panel, if you get your submission early enough, you can click this handy invite link to actually then invite them to go in and do their own disclosure. But just note that all disclosures will have to be completed either by the submitter or by the actual panelists prior to the submission of uh, the abstract. So speaking of abstracts, we know there are two general types of abstracts. There are those for more of a lecture or a didactic format, and there are the scientific uh, abstracts. Uh, the scientific abstracts fall into either oral pre presentations or poster presentations. Dr. Carr, I know you have a lot of experience with these types of abstracts. Can you uh, share your best advice? How would you advise someone to decide if they should be submitting an oral presentation or a poster presentation? So I would say an oral presentation is pretty competitive. You'd want to have a project that kind of appeals to clinicians, isn't too niche, and is well designed and complete. Um, you also have to remember that if you do an oral, you're responsible to submit a full manuscript by the deadline. Sometimes it's before the meeting, sometimes it's after, but you, you're obligated to write the paper. For a poster, you don't have that obligation, although it's recommended that you try and submit to the to our journal if you are plan to write a paper. Um, poster presentations are usually a little bit less lower impact projects, things like case reports. There are occasionally orals, but mostly posters, um, things that might be kind of niche, some basic science. You have to remember that most of the attendees, well, probably all of them are clinicians looking for the next thing that they're going to use to make their practice better. So people are really looking for clinical tidbits and pearls. So if you have a basic science thing, it might be better as a poster. That's kind of my opinion on that. Um, Dr. Doris Mine, you actually have given some oral presentations. Can you tell someone who hasn't done it before, what's it like to give an oral scientific presentation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in, in terms of an oral presentation at the academy, particularly, they tend to be on the shorter side. Um, and so you can expect to um, give your presentation, but really give the highlights of what it is like, you know, do it in a way that can really um, get your point across quickly and effectively to um, your audience. And that is something that is a little bit different in some other places, but I think um, really gets to the crux of your project. And I think is really what we people want to hear and um, is kind of a, the most useful thing for, for people, I think. Um, other things you can expect is some questions um, at the end of your presentation. You know, people have really some thought provoking questions that you may not have thought of, which can be really helpful for you in terms of thinking about next steps for your projects or um, a new project that you could work on. Um, so those are just a couple of things that you can start thinking about or be expecting. Thank, thank you for, for that. Um, I have to say I've, I've gotten sort of my first level of uh, feedback on papers uh, when I present them at the meeting, sort of the big picture feedback, you know, people pointing out major flaws yeah. or major strengths of my papers. And that's been a real boon for me as I've thought about how to turn them into to publications. Um, Dr. Carr, when you're, when you're reviewing abstract submissions for, for science, uh, what are the main things that you're looking for to decide if you'd like to accept or, or decline uh, a submission? First of all, the Abstract should be very clear, clearly written, and very concise. You want to have a stated purpose. What was the purpose? What was the question you were trying to answer? That should appear in your, in your abstract. You want to have actual numbers, some kind of real data. It shouldn't be an abstract that you write about a project you're going to do next month. It should be something that you've already got some data. And then what I think what sinks a lot of abstracts is conclusions that are either not following the data or conclusions that are overstated. So you wanna make sure that your conclusion matches the data that you've collected and that your analysis is what you've shown. Um, and again, my plug for clinical papers, we're all looking for something that's clinical. It's why we go to these meetings. So I would favor a clinical paper over a, a basic science paper for this meeting. Yeah, I, I have to say, I, I 
feel like when I'm reviewing, for me, the promise of data is an automatic um, knock against it. Um, this is one where you need to have the data in hand and make it clear in your abstract. You've already you've done the work. You have an abstract based on real data. And, and that for me also is a, is a, a real landmine when I see it on a, on a submission. Um, uh, I, I think that we do see a lot of incredible basic science, particularly in the poster halls. And I know for a lot of um, international meetings, especially being able to present your poster uh, science is a really great opportunity. And um, we also have our posters in a digital format so that even people not attending the meeting can get access to view the posters in a digital format afterwards. And I, and I do wanna remind all of our submitters that if you submit science to the annual meeting, whether in oral or poster format, it is embargoed to the journal Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, the journal of our academy. Um, uh, oral presentations are required to have a submission to the journal. Uh, posters do not have to be submitted, but if they are going to be submitted to a journal for publication, they have to be submitted to our journal or to Odo Open, the sister journal, um, and uh, cannot be submitted elsewhere unless they are first offered to our journals. Um, the uh, presentation can be given in another meeting after it's presented our academy meeting, so long as our academy meeting and our academy journals are cited, um, but it cannot be presented elsewhere before the academy meeting. So things to keep in mind if you're uh, submitting some science. Um, the next type of submission is the, the what we would consider more the didactics, the panel presentations and the expert lectures. Um, our academy has a really incredible, robust history going back over 100 years of these educational offerings. Uh, the expert lectures first came about as a response to the organizing um, otolaryngology board exams. Our academy organized the American Board of Otolaryngology uh, back in the early 1900s, and the, the expert lecture series in its original iteration was to help standardize the knowledge base of those going to take that exam and to help uh, standardize the knowledge base in the field for postgraduates um, who were dispersed all over the country in uh, small, uh, often isolated settings. They could come to the annual meeting and get this uh, expert education. And so uh, we really have a robust and wonderful um, didactic component to the annual meeting in the panel presentations and in the expert lectures. So Dr. Wong, can I ask you, um, if someone was considering whether it would be most appropriate to be giving a panel presentation or an expert lecture, how would you advise them to, to distinguish between the two? Yes, I think the focus for each uh, type of presentation is a little bit different. And I think you've outlined it here on this slide very well. A panel presentation topic is often maybe a controversial one where there's not a complete consensus across experts. And it's the opportunity for the panelists who are all experts to debate the pros and cons, you know, the, uh, the uh, different aspects of the topic that they're looking at, maybe different techniques, maybe different approaches to a disease process. So there's gonna be one moderator and two to three experts. So it's more of a debate format where there may not be a right answer. Uh, in contrast, expert lectures are given by experts in the area. So it's often to teach maybe a new surgical technique or to outline a new treatment algorithm or confirm existing treatment algorithms for a certain disease process. And usually there's one to two speakers. They each have had a lot of experience in this topic. And it's more of a, a traditional didactic lecture, uh, not as much debate or discussion as in a uh, panel presentation. And how would you suggest that submitters come up with ideas for either panel presentations or expert lectures? So again, I'll, I'll take you back to what you started talking about, the gap analysis, because the Academy spends a lot of time putting together those topics. It's based on a lot of things. They look at the past programs. They look at the comments, the suggestions. If you go to uh, any of the Academy meetings, in order to get your CME, you have to fill out an evaluation. And those evaluations are taken seriously. Uh, that You can be asked, you know, what, what topics you'd like to see in the future? What topics did you attend that you found particularly valuable? And so from that, that, there's a list of topics in the gap analysis, and they can range from anything from uh, chronic cough to um, changes in the voice, uh, cancer treatments, etc. And that can really guide you if you're looking at trying to find a topic, uh, because you know those topics will be given priorities uh, for, the, for the next year's meetings. Uh, you can also look at the previous programs. Sometimes there are a lot of 
panels and, and presentations on a particular topic, that might be good or bad. That might mean that that topic is very relevant to today's practitioner in older laryngology, or it might mean maybe there's too much on that topic. But if you can come up with a different viewpoint, a different spin on a topic, it would be welcome. And I think the program committee would look at that and uh, potentially see some value in presenting a topic a, a, along a slightly different perspective. Yeah, I, I have to say, I, I think that that is, that is key to be sort of aware of the conversation. I mean, I, I view these presentations as an ongoing conversation amongst our field. And it's sort of good to know when you're the 15th person to jump into a conversation that's already pretty robustly been carried out, it's, you're not as likely to bring something new to it necessarily, and the committee's not going to look at that as highly. Are there any other landmines for the submissions in your mind, things that would cause you to grade a submission lower? Well, I think uh, writing the abstract is an extremely important part of the submission. And so you want to make sure that your abstract is clearly written with good grammar, spelling, punctuation, et cetera. Um, so proofread it carefully. Consult with your other presenters, the other experts. Um, I just want to make a plug for the committees. The different academy committees often will come up with topics to uh, prepare for either a panel presentation or expert lectures. And that's a, a, a likely source of other experts in the area. So work with your committees. If you're not on a committee, volunteer to be on one where uh, they're always looking for, for people to join the committees. And the other uh, important aspect is collaboration between the different committees. And so I've been successful over the years collaborating. I was real active in the Complementary Integrative Medicine Committee, and we collaborated with the Cancer, the Head and Neck Cancer Committee, the uh, Infectious Disease Committee, the P committees, and then you're getting experts from across the spectrum, and together you can put together an abstract to make sure that it covers relevant topics, make sure it's well-written, to make sure that you do have true experts. Uh, so in the submission section, they'll have a question about, you know, what kind of experience has this speaker had? Um, have they written about this topic? Have they presented it at other academy meetings? And so that's where it's, it's good to find the experts so that you know that you are getting the very best speakers for this topic. Uh, the committee, the, the program committee also looks at the speaker's previous courses and scores, and that helps it can maybe make a difference between one panel topic and the next. If you have a really good set of speakers who have had experience, had done well in previous academy presentations, had gotten good scores and good comments from the people that attended the previous uh, lectures. I agree full heartedly. I, I love when I'm looking at expert lectures to see a bibliography that clearly demonstrates publication and presentation history on the topic. When I see no publication or presentation history on a, on a topic especially for an expert lecture, it makes me really begin to question, question whether or not that would be the best thing for us to present at the meeting. I've included these pictures on this slide because I think they bring out uh, an important aspect of uh, panel presentations. Uh, uh, on the left here, you can see that we have a panel of three very prominent Academy members giving uh, a robust discussion about a topic. And then we have one of our rising star residents who moderated the panel. And I think that moderating panels is an excellent opportunity for young physicians and trainees to get involved in presenting at the academy. You don't have to be the expert to moderate the experts, and I would strongly encourage that. Uh, the other thing, this is a panel I gave with three of my dear friends, and get together with your friends. The, the opportunity to create a panel together with your friends is a wonderful way to, to be involved at the meeting, to further your collaboration, and, and I strongly would uh, encourage that. We also take simulation submissions this year both uh, small and large group format simulation submissions. Um, please, in your submission, do let us know what supplies you'll need and if they are attainable. Um, the Academy can help with some things, but uh, a lot of the supplies for simulation sessions need to be arranged by the speakers, sometimes with the companies that have been supporting submission work. We really love to see simulation submissions that have been proven successful in other settings perhaps at your medical school, at another medical meeting. We'd like to see that the concept has proven to be a successful uh, simulation topic in, in other settings. Um, the International Forum will also be accepting submissions as always. This is a wonderful opportunity for our international colleagues to bring your expertise, what's unique uh, where you are practicing, to bring it to the meeting to share on an international stage. Um, I've seen some really successful ones where a, a US uh, or Canadian uh, moderator 
was addressing a topic that we're struggling with here in, in the US, uh, but that has different perspectives from overseas. Uh, there was a wonderful one on central, uh, central neck dissection and thyroid cancer uh, by a group of South American surgeons moderated by a US uh, surgeon a couple of years ago. So uh, those are wonderful opportunities. I would encourage you if you don't have an English uh, writing expert in the group to reach out to an English writing expert because we will want to see a submission that demonstrates um, expertise in presenting in English. The one exception, we do have some Spanish language sessions at the meeting every year, and we accept uh, submissions from our Spanish speaking colleagues uh, to the meeting for those specific sessions. There are over 55 members of the program committee. These are actually the folks who will be reviewing your submissions, and I'm terribly grateful to them for their volunteer work in, in reviewing well over 1,500 submissions every year uh, for the annual meeting. When you submit, you'll be submitting on a specific specialty track. Here are the, the tracks and their leaders on this side of the page. So there is some consideration. If you're submitting an advanced lecture in neurotology, you're going to want to submit under otology, neurotology. But if you're submitting an otology talk that's really geared towards helping a comprehensive otolaryngologist address a common otologic problem, it might be better to submit it under comprehensive otolaryngology. But just know that wherever you submit it, experts from that track will be the ones reviewing your uh, specific presentation. And uh, Dr. Wong mentioned that it's wonderful to have the support of committees. Um, we love seeing collaboration amongst committees. New this year, we will be sending the CME feedback and scores on sponsored talks back to the committee so the committees can see how their sponsored talks are doing and help them strategize uh, for the next years. If you have any questions about the Call for Science, please reach out to us at programs at entnet.org, where our wonderful staff is always monitoring this email and can help you with questions about the Call for Science or other aspects of the annual meeting. Uh, and so uh, let me circle back to our, our panelists here for any final words of advice for our submitters in the call for science. Dr. Doris Mon, we'll start with you. Sure, I would just say, if you have a project, go ahead and try to submit it to the Academy. I think it's an incredible uh, conference to go to. Um, and so if you have any chance of submitting something, go ahead and try it. Um, of course, follow these guidelines that we just talked about. Um, but if you think it's... Uh, a good project and you have it completed by the deadline, go ahead and try to submit it. Thank you. Dr. Carr. I have two things. The first is plan ahead. Don't leave this till the day before the deadline to figure out who your co-authors are and, and write your abstracts. So first of all, plan ahead. And second of all, if you don't have the experience to write a scientific abstract, find someone locally who can mentor you it may be someone in your department, but it could also be someone in another department. So do find someone who can help you out with that part as well. Thank you, Dr. Carr. Dr. Wong. Yeah, I would echo Dr. Carr. We're really looking for submissions from a diverse group of otolaryngologists. If you're a senior member, really consider reaching out to one of your former fellows or residents to work together on a project. It's always good, good to get fresh ideas, maybe from a younger person. If you're a younger person, reach out, like Dr. Carr said, to um, one of your former attendings or faculty members, because they would love to work with you. And that's how we can make our program better, by bringing more people to be involved. Thank you, Dr. Wong. You know, we've been doing this for 126 years coming up this fall, and the only reason we have this meeting is because we all stepped forward to contribute our voices to the conversation. So this call for science is our chance to add your voice to the ongoing discussion of otolaryngology, of who we are, of where we've been, and where we're going as a field and as a community. Um, we look forward to seeing your submissions, and we look forward to seeing you in Philadelphia next fall.